right, welcome back, boys and girls. We're going to continue our discussion related to intermolecular forces of attraction. Um, not too long ago, we completed a unit where we drew Lewis structures and showed covalent bonding. That would be an example of intramolecular forces of attraction. Now we're talking about forces of attraction between molecules. And there are a few different types of forces we need to discuss. The first are called London dispersion forces. Um, a lot of the time we call them just LDFs, an acronym for that, or simply dispersion forces. So take, for example, oxygen. If you folks remember oxygen, we draw the Lewis structure for that. There's a double bond between the two oxygen atoms, and you can see that there's no dipole. The electrons are shared completely evenly uh, between the two oxygen atoms. Um, under the right conditions, however, oxygen molecules can be compressed into a liquid. In other words, there's some force of attraction between this oxygen molecule and a neighboring or neighboring molecules. Somehow, these guys are attracted to each other, and that force of attraction is called an intermolecular force of attraction. So if it's nonpolar, there's no positive and negative end, is there? So what's causing them to be attracted to each other to condense from a gaseous state where the molecules are really far away from each other to a liquid state where they're fairly close to each other. Well, that force of attraction is called a dispersion force. Dispersion forces are weak forces that result from temporary shifts in the density of electrons in the electron cloud. Dispersion forces are something called, sometimes called London dispersion forces, or LDFs, after the German physicist who first described them. Uh, Fritz London. So a lot of times we like to think of the electron cloud that surrounds an atom as a nice pretty spherical cloud. A nice round sphere and um, it's not undulating at all. When in reality it does. It moves from side to side, top to bottom, forward and backwards. And so sometimes for a moment if this is the nucleus of the atom right there, that cloud might be to the left of the nucleus. And that would make this side of the molecule positively charged for a moment, and this side of the molecule negatively charged for a moment. We call those temporary dipoles. And so as the oxygen molecules experiences, experience this, the positive end of one molecule that's temporarily there could be attracted to the negative end of another molecule that's there. Um, and that's what we call London dispersion forces. Once again, these are very, very weak forces of attraction. And so in order to, to liquefy something like oxygen, the temperature needs to be quite low. Now, dispersion forces exist between all particles, even those that are polar. Um, dispersion forces are weak for smaller particles. And these forces have an increasing effect as the number of electrons involved increases. Thus, dispersion forces tend to become what as the size of the particle increases? And if you listen, they tend to become stronger. So the bigger the particle, the more electrons it has, the stronger the LDFs. For example, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine exist as diatomic molecules, just like oxygen a moment ago. Recall that the number of non-valence electrons increases from chlorine, uh, from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine. Because the larger halogen molecules have more electrons, there can be a greater difference between the positive and negative regions of their temporary dipoles, and thus stronger dispersion forces. This difference in dispersion forces explains why fluorine and chlorine are gases. Bromine, having a bigger molecular weight, more electrons, is a liquid. And iodine is a solid at room temperature. So it becomes easier for these bigger molecules to become attracted to each other and condense or solidify. So those are called London dispersion forces. Now, the next type of intermolecular force of attraction is called a dipole-to-dipole -dipole force of attraction. This actually is much more easily understood, something that I think you'll 
uh, grab hold of pretty quickly. If you have a polar molecule, they contain permanent dipoles, not temporary ones due to the undulation of that electron cloud, but they're permanent. That is, some regions of a polar molecule are always partially negative, and some regions of the molecule are always partially positive. These attractions between oppositely charged regions of polar molecules are called dipole to dipole forces. Neighboring molecules, as you can imagine, orientate themselves so that oppositely charged regions end up aligning themselves with each other. So, if we take the hydrogen chloride molecule, and if we draw its Lewis structure, it looks like this. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so this pair of electrons being shared between hydrogen and chlorine ends up being pulled towards the chlorine side of that molecule, giving this a partial negative charge and this side a partial positive charge. So we have a permanent dipole. Now, you can imagine if we have two hydrogen chloride molecules next to each other or thrown in a box and we shake that box up, they're going to clump together. The negative end of one uh, being attracted to the positive end of a neighboring molecule. Here's a, another illustration where it shows several of those molecules being attracted to each other. Now once again, these dotted regions right here, those are the inter molecular forces of attraction. And in this case, since we have a positive end of a molecule being attracted to a negative end of another molecule, we call those dipole to dipole forces of attraction. Okay? All right. Now, a special type of dipole to dipole attraction is called hydrogen bonding. Now, please do not think that if a molecule has the element hydrogen in it, it can automatically hydrogen bond. That is not true. Let me explain it to you. This is a special case of a dipole to dipole attraction. Hydrogen, in order to be able to hydrogen bond with a neighboring molecule, must be bonded to either N, nitrogen, O, oxygen, or fluorine. As you recall, N, O, and F are the three most electronegative elements. So, if I have a molecule like HF or H2O or NH3 or CH3OH where hydrogen is directly bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, we can, we can form with another or neighboring molecule a hydrogen bond. Please remember, it is not a bond between hydrogen atoms. So, let me explain it a little bit more. Um, the classic example is hydrogen fluoride. So there's the Lewis structure for hydrogen fluoride, right there. Now, fluorine has an electronegativity of really close to 4. Hydrogen's is considerably lower. This pair of electrons right here, let's change colors for a sec, this pair of electrons is not shared evenly at all. In fact, the electronegativity difference is so great that there, that pair spends almost all of its time around the fluorine end of the molecule. Now hydrogen is interesting. Hydrogen only has one electron. So that one electron is being shared with fluorine. If that one electron spends all of its time around fluorine, what covers hydrogen's nucleus? Yeah, nothing would. And so we end up having what we like to call a bare proton. B-A-R-E. So hydrogen becomes a bare proton. That means there's no electrons covering it. And so a neighboring molecule with its negative electron cloud can get really, really close to that hydrogen nucleus and form a relatively strong dipole-to-dipole -dipole attraction. In fact, it's so strong, we give it its own classification. We call it a hydrogen bond. So, if another hydrogen fluoride molecule was nearby, you can see that they would line up in this fashion, where the positive end of that hydrogen will line up with the negative end of the neighboring fluorine, and then, or excuse, 
of the, the negative end of the fluorine in the neighboring molecule, and that is called a hydrogen bond. So, here's an illustration. Water is another very, very common example. If you can see here in this illustration, oxygen is bonded to hydrogen here and here. So we have two bare protons, a very positive end here and here, and a very negative end here. So you can see this oxygen here in the middle, that's negative. Do you see how it's being attracted to the hydrogen in this neighboring molecule over here, and this one over here? Now these hydrogens are positive, remember, because they're electron spending almost all of its time around the very electronegative oxygen. And so it can hydrogen bond with neighboring molecules over here and here. Notice this hydrogen is attracted to the oxygen in the neighboring molecule. So hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole to dipole attraction that occurs between hydrogen and one molecule and either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in a neighboring molecule. And that hydrogen in one molecule must be bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Now, this explains, by the way, why water is a liquid at room temperature. Its molecular weight is only about 18 grams per mole. It does have some LDF forces, but they're relatively weak for that small molecule. So the explanation as to why water is a liquid at room temperature comes because it can hydrogen bond with neighboring water molecules. So let me give you another example here, uh, or three examples. Uh, we have water, methane, and ammonia. Now if I draw the Lewis structure kiddos for methane, it looks like this, and I hope you would agree it is nonpolar. Now if I draw the Lewis structure for water, it's a bent molecule. Do you remember these non-bonding pairs push those hydrogens down into a bent configuration? And that is a polar molecule. And so is ammonia. That's a trigonal pyramid shape. This non-bonding pair pushes those hydrogens down into a pyramidal shape. And so this is also polar. There's a positive and negative end. But it's a special type of polar molecule because we have hydrogens directly bonded to N, O, or F. So hydrogen is bonded to O in water and nitrogen and ammonia. Now it's bonded to carbon and methane, CH4. The electronegativity difference is not as strong. And so these shared pairs of electrons are shared more evenly. And so hydrogen has electrons covering its nucleus. So in methane, it's not a bare proton. So that would mean that methane would have a very, very low uh, boiling point. And it does, negative 162. And its molecular weight is pretty close to that of waters and of ammonias. Ammonia would have a much higher boiling point, and it does. It's negative 33 degrees Celsius because it can hydrogen bond. And water has a very high boiling point for its molecular weight. Of course, you know it's 100 degrees Celsius. So it's hard to move water molecules away from each other to take them from the liquid phase into the gaseous phase because of these hydrogen bonds between water molecules. Okay, so we have LDFs, we have dipole to dipole, and we have hydrogen bonding. So let's do a quick example here. Um, which of these molecules listed below can form hydrogen bonds? For which molecules would dispersion forces be the only intermolecular force? And give reasons for your answer. So, H2, can that hydrogen bond? Now, some students that weren't listening will say, well, sure it can. Hydrogen's bonded to hydrogen. That's a hydrogen bond. No, it cannot. So, this cannot H bond. It's a nonpolar molecule. Hydrogen's bonded to itself. So, it has... Only LDFs. So we would expect that to have a very, very low boiling point. It's easy to separate one hydrogen molecule from another. How about H2S? Well, hydrogen is bonded to sulfur here. So remember, it has to be bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So this cannot H bond either. But if I were to draw its Lewis structure, 
and I'm going to draw it in its bent configuration because it is a bent molecule, you can see that it's not, um, it, you can see that the dipoles will not cancel because of the orientation of the hydrogens with respect to the sulfur. So this has a negative end and a positive end. So this has dipole to dipole attraction. as well as LDFs. HCl? Hmm. Well, H is bonded to chlorine here. Nope, it has to be bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So no, that cannot H bond. So if I were to draw its Lewis structure, H is bonded to Cl. Looks like that. The negative ends over here, the positive ends over here. That is not a bare proton. So it does have electrons covering it part of the time, so it cannot H-bond, but it is dipole to dipole. And it also has LDFs, but the dipoles to dipoles are much stronger. And then finally, HF. Yeah, hydrogen is bonded to fluorine here. This one can hydrogen bond. Because hydrogen is bonded directly to the fluorine. So this hydrogen, kiddos, is a bare proton. So the next HF molecule can get really, really close, to, or the fluorine part of the next or neighboring HF molecule can get really close to that hydrogen. Okay? All right. We'll do another example to begin our next video, and then we'll talk about some other forces of attraction between molecules. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.